my longest yard thing and just put it on top of the table with no case. It took me three months to get that fucking thing. So I yelled at it. I go, what the fuck are you thinking? My DVDs. I went to Santa Fe. I come back. All my DVDs are scratched. Takes my DVDs and throws them in the fucking love compartment. Takes two minutes to do the job, man. Takes two fucking minutes. Wait, you're saying all the stuff that uh, all the... The DVD I brought over here. I put it in the machine. She decided to watch a movie last night. Takes a DVD and puts it on the metal on top of the television. It took me three months to get it because that one fucking copy. What are you fucking thinking, guy? That's why she's mad. I don't give a fuck. My Jay-Z is scratched. My Biggie's fucking scratched. They're brand new. How do they scratch? She takes the CDs and she puts them in the center compartment. I tell her a thousand times, when you walk in the house, take the fucking keys and hang them on the hook. Women add to the drama. Every night I got to look for the fucking keys. Every night I got to look for the fucking keys. Put the air and I tell her over and over and over and over. It slows me down in the fucking morning. And she can't find the keys. Men, when they come in, they put the keys in the same they place They put the keys every in the time. same fucking place. Women, like, like, like Rusty Dooley, too, they don't know where the keys are. They'll come in for two minutes, they won't remember. Hang the, the fucking key up. I tell her a thousand times, if you do fucking the laundry, do it right. Put the clothes that I wear constantly on top. So when I go to get dressed in the morning, I have to know how to hunt this shit down. I go, if, you, if I did laundry, I wouldn't put skirts up first, because I know you... I know you... <laughs> I know that you fucking wear jeans to work. Same thing applies here. If you're going to do something, Makes sense. do it right. Bro, when she lived here, when Julie lived here, I had to do hurdles over her suitcase for her for me to get around my own room. And she's like, I can't get around this room. How about these two fucking mounds of clothes that she claims are clean? She kept her clothes in a clean mound in the middle of the room. And she expected me to live like that. That's why I, I, I sent her home, man. I couldn't take it anymore. Back, I said, back. goodbye. I know you said it before. I should have listened to you a long time ago. That was... I can save you a lot of time and energy. First of all, the girl and you are not going to get along. You know why? She's not a sex chick. She's not going to let you come on her eyeballs. No, that's not going to happen. So you're going to be bored. You're going to cheat on her a month later. I know you. You need action. You're like me. You need action. Action. Every day. Action. I want a girl. What is a girl who wants to fuck every moment. He touches her leg, she's, well, come on, come on, you know, that, I need that, man. She's like, little Miss, I was fingering her there, she goes, ow. That's it, that's, I couldn't take it. Ow, a finger, my, my nails are clipped, what, 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 ow, what? It's like, ow, just fucking take a fist in there, that's what I need, you know, it, whatever, I, I want to be able to be fulfilled. She's too needy for a girlfriend, for a comedy. She's not on my page, you know, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, she's not with me, she's against me. Well, the first time you book something, you're gone for two weeks, you're fucked. You're gonna get calls 24 hours a day. I can't get this air conditioner to work. You know what? I'm in fucking South Bend. It's fucking 10 below, it's January. I, I need a life here, guy. So, I don't know. So, so women, women in the comic scene. It doesn't work out, it just doesn't fucking work, man. It never has. Unless you find, I mean, I don't know any, I don't know any comics out here in Los Angeles who have girlfriends that are cool with the whole, the whole life of it all. Being out till two in the morning. Well, they're not going to be ever cool. They try, see, in the beginning, it's a novelty. Nobody really dates a comic. Right. So when a girlfriend dates a comic, she calls her girlfriend the next day. It's exciting. It's, it's new. We have a comic. It's not it. Now, wait till she moves in. Yeah. You know, three, she, you know what she said to me the other day? You work too much. You go, you go, you get on stage too much. You're always working. Why don't you just take a day off? I go. What are you talking about? This is my life. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. What do you mean take a day off? And what? Go to the Grove and sh and window shop with you with my twenty bucks in my pocket? That's what I like to do. Is shut window shop. Waste time. Waste fucking time. Spend money that we don't have. I don't have money to spend. I don't have money to spend on her. She wants to, doesn't this blouse looks good? Yeah, it looks good, but what's it doing for my fucking career? I want you with your blouse off. Yeah, that's it. You know it. what I'm saying? I want you with the blouse off, not with the blouse on. She comes out of the shower, she's naked, she goes, why are you looking at me? You're just going to get excited and want to have sex. That's it. That was it. That was it for me. That was all. All you want to do is have sex. That's right. Yeah. Now bend over. Period. And say, I'll 
she has this beautiful little body, and all I want to do is fuck her. And the whole time, she doesn't. I'll kiss her. She goes, why are you kissing me? What are you doing? Oh, Jewel, you don't get it. I don't want to have conversations with you. All right, Jewel, the fucking interview. This is so, so anyway, we're making a movie about comedy. I understand. Yes, God, what we're doing. And it's partially, you know, it happens to be about partially Mark, my favorite movie. Uh, right, we're just getting warmed up. Yeah, relax hey, there. He's the co-director, bitch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, but he's, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Joey Diaz, uh, what's going on? He's co-directing him. What's happening? Co-featured. You were, okay, if you were, you were, you're a, co you're a comic. Stand-up comic, sir. You're a stand-up comic. So when did you get started? Uh, June of 91 in Boulder, Colorado. Um, okay, June 91 in Boulder, Colorado. What uh, made you get up to become a comedian? I just always wanted to try it. I thought it seemed fun. You're up there by yourself. You're talking about from when you were a kid and stuff? Yeah, always wanted to try it. Your buddies made you go up, didn't they? Nah, from the first time I heard The Niggas Crazy by Richard Pryor, that album, I knew that there was something there. I didn't know how I would pursue it. You never know how to get into things, you know? So you were living in Boulder? I was living in Boulder. Doing? Roofing. Roofing? I had just come out of the joint. Okay. You did out of the joint. Four? Kidnapping one, two, aggravated robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, a bunch of them. Okay. I had a fucking, that was the parlay of crime day for me. November 18th, 1987. Okay, so then you end up in Boulder, you're roofing. Yeah, I'm an estimator for a roofing company. Okay, and you uh, hear, you just happened to get a copy? How did you get that copy of Richard Pryor? Oh, I got that when I was 10. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, when I was a kid, I got that. So you had, you had harbored this desire this to This desire. Comic. I didn't know where to start. I would sit at home and watch these comics and say, I'm a lot funnier than that. And then I seen Dice Clay. And I sat there and actually said to myself, this guy's saying everything, everything I'm thinking. All the time. This is how I feel. You know, this is how guys really fucking think. And this guy finally put it on paper. So I was roofing one day, and I went to get a, a lunch for the guys. It was snowing, and we were shoveling the roof. And I went to get lunch for the guys, and Rocky Mountain News had an article about comedy. Roseanne Barr had just hit. So it was like rampant in Denver. Everybody was going to be a star. And I read this article on taking a stand-up class. Here I am. Okay, so you, so then what? You, so you were taking a stand-up class. It's three weeks, a stand-up comedy class okay. at the University of Colorado. Take one of us. Thirty-eight bucks. All right, and then the, at the end of the class, you get up and perform. No, it took me like six months after that. I got a job as a doorman first at Wits End in uh, Colorado, and then my first time on stage at the Denver Comedy Works. And you got the you just got the courage up one day, and or you had what? the material. You've been working on material. Yeah, yeah. And you felt like it was time. It felt like it was time. Did you have, did you want to become a star? How did you like, what was your ultimate goal? Uh, I didn't know. I was just, you know, I got divorced and I was just, I liked the whole idea of these guys traveling every weekend and seeing new places and that really got my fancy. Just getting on stage and just the whole dynamic of it from start to finish. It's like the first night, uh, how did it go? It went pretty good. In fact, I got, I got a gig opening up for the Broncos and training camp at Greeley. And I did that. And then I did it a couple times. And as most comics, after you do it five times, you're a stand-up comic, you know. You get the cards, and you start wearing a suit, and then you bomb real hard, and then it brings you back to square one. What, what happens when you don't do comedy for a while? Does it just get you? I haven't done comedy right now in a month and a half, and people have asked me why have I been so weird lately. I'm angrier, you know. Little note, little things are, are you can notice. Them. It's just something about comedy, man. It keeps us focused. It keeps us in the middle. But I'm working on something right now, and I don't like mixing apples and oranges, you know. And that's why I've just been taking some time off. And besides that, I'm, I'm a little. You know, I don't want to use this in your thing, but we'll talk about it on camera. I'm really a little disgruntled with the state of comedy right now. Is it because of L.A.? Uh, L.A. and the whole scene is just a shitty scene right now for comedy. There's nothing really there. People don't come out to support like the people who, you know, when you live in Montana, 
I don't expect fucking NBC there, you know. Well, you live in L.A., you expect somebody to come up to you after or something like that, you know. But nobody respects us anymore. We don't have that respect anymore where people will actually come and see us now in L.A. sometimes. Maybe I'm talking stupid. I don't you, think, know. you think Last Comic Standing? Just well, that, that destroyed it, too. That was the beginning of the end, along with a lot of other factors. You know, bad comics are getting a lot of money for shows. You know, just because of one obscure reference, all of a sudden this guy's getting 3500 on the show. He's got 18 minutes of material. Do you know what I'm saying? And here you have comics that work hard and nothing. Nobody even talks to them. Just because this guy did a show on Stern or something like that. All of a sudden his money goes up. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Shit like that, you know. So I'm a little weird on it. But I'm, I know comedy, comedy's been around forever, you know. Comedy's been around forever. Since day one, you know. So I know it'll, it'll come back, you know. You always come back to it, you know. And I'm starting to miss it now. Like right now I'm thinking about doing comedy again. You know, like just, I do it every day at work. Do you know what I'm saying? Basically with the guys around and stuff, but it's not the same, you know. So do you prefer acting uh, uh, over stand-up? No. There's nothing as pure as stand-up comedy. It's pure. It's it's pure. You can't even describe it unless you're a stand-up. You know, I could be doing a scene with whoever, and there's something about comedy that still just rocks over anything else. So being in the moment. Yeah, being in the moment is big. You know, just it's your twist on things. With a movie, it's a great movie, but somebody else wrote it. You know, for comics, that's very hard. That's very hard, especially if you don't. If you're not, you know, a professional plagiarist, as a lot of comics are in the business, you know, where they rewrite somebody else's joke, or they think it's okay, you know. I respect writers, but maybe I can come up with something funny. Let's just try it, you know. Yeah. Now, you lived in Seattle for a while, too, right? Yeah. What happened in Seattle? Uh, I got arrested five times in a year and a half. Uh, comedy was great in Seattle. Seattle was what I needed at that time. Because you do need a home base. You need a place you can call home for a while that's away from this bullshit in L.A. It's away from the resumes, the web pages. Comedy's very pure. There's no web pages. There's no fucking headshots. There's no, you know, gimmicks. There's no selling CDs after the show. No T-shirts, no umbrellas, no sandals, nothing. You go up, you do what you believe in, and you get the fuck off the stage. That's comedy to me. And that's what Seattle put into me. It taught me how to go to an open mic every Monday and it becoming home. If, there's, if, the earth, if the end of the world happens and that stage still has lights and four people go down there, comedy's still on. Comedy's still on. And that's what we forget about it. That it's a process that, and that's what Seattle offered me. Denver didn't have comedy every night. Everything was a production. Comedy to me is not even a theater. Comedy to me is a smoky room with dim lights and strong drinks and some jerk off up there talking about what happened that day. That's comedy. You know, cigarette smoke. And, uh, yeah. And that's what I miss. I miss that feeling. That's what the comedy store does give you, though. It's dark. You don't know who the hell you're talking to. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. My, well, my, my girl came to see me the other day. There's like seven people in the audience. She was like, what are you going to do? And there's only seven people. And I went up and I rocked them. And she couldn't. She didn't understand. No, civilians don't understand. There's only seven people. You're not going to. What can you do? Anybody. I can get a retarded kid. Work with him for two weeks. And he can make 300 people laugh. Seven people. That's a gift from God. That's a, that's something you got to work at. Even Dice the other day. Four people in the audience. Anyway. That's it. Anybody go, go up in front of 300 people. Let me see you go up in front of 20 people, you know. And you know what? A lot of comics can't handle that. A lot of comics cannot handle that. Well, what do you see happening in comedy in the future? Like anything else, bro. Cream rises to the top. You know what? The Yankees are in the, world, uh, the playoffs right now. And I know somewhere along this playoff chain, John Olerud, is going to hit a tremendous shot to win a game or a series. Because cream rises to the top. Whether you're 20 or you're 40, cream rises to the top. You're going to come through. Something's going to happen. You're going to hit a fucking grand slam or something. 
And the same thing's going to happen with comedy. That's the process we're going into right now. Right now in comedy, we're too top-heavy and we're too bottom-heavy. So shit has to roll over. A lot of comics got to go away. You know who you are. It's the time to go away. Let it go. Try ping-pong. Te- you know what I'm saying? I mean, John Campanara is teaching a comedy class. He got the hint. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a young guy's game in a way. And if you don't produce at some levels, you got to rotate with the fuck like anything else in life. Michael Jordan was a great player. He had to move on. You follow me? You have to move on. Do you think you'll be doing stand-up in 10 years? <sighs> Honestly, no. Depends on a film career, yes. It all depends on what I do in film, or if I get on a TV show full-time or something like that. Me? Yeah, I'll be doing comedy in 10 years. I don't know if I'll be on the road. You know, I don't know if anybody will still hire me. You know? Do you, do you think, you'd, uh, think you'd ever go back on the road? Yeah, I'm going back next month. Where are you going? Dallas, Beaumont, and Chicago. Cool. My three little... Good city. Right next to each now, now, what do you think about women in comedy? Not, not comedians, I mean, you having a girl. How do, they, how do they affect you? Just like men, a woman has a natural evolution. And you can't break away from that fucking evolution. Me as a man, when I see a guy walking down the street with a baby carriage, strolling, that guy wants to fucking shoot himself. Because he's not doing it for any fucking particular reason. If you see lions playing, the mother's always playing with the fucking lions. They come over to the father once in a while, and after like two little things, he fucking whacks it. Because it's not our evolution. You have to go with what evolves. A woman, no matter what she tells you at 25, at 30, she's a different woman. And if any, everything else comes in. The eggs start popping. You know what I'm saying? They want to have kids. All their cousins have kids. You know what I'm saying? They don't want to be alone. It's security. It's been going on since the fucking beginning of time. Mary Magdalene had a fucking boyfriend and a kid. Do you follow what I'm saying to you? Mm-hmm. And that's... So you think when a man has a baby, he's basically saying, I'm done? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying natural evolution of things. So a woman might tell you, it's great that you do comedy, it's so exciting. After a year, she doesn't want to see your fucking act anymore. Just like, I don't want to fucking hear it. You follow me? I don't want to hear my act anymore after a year. So they start going different directions. What was cool a year ago, we were just dating, and I had my day job, isn't going to be cool when you're paying the bills. And, you know, when she has two kids, you have two kids with a woman, all of a sudden those three weeks used to go on, become a hindrance. Yeah, it's in the way. And women don't understand that we have to go on the road. It's our natural thing. You know, fuck it. It's our natural thing. That's what you do as a comic. You have to go to the comedy store. There's some nights it's not cut in stone. Your set is not 10.15 and you're home by 10.45, you know. And after a while, women can't take that. Especially when they talk to their girlfriend Nancy and their husband's been in all night and they went to some show and that's not going to work. Because women have to make for other women, you know. Well, my mic did this. My mic did that. Go fuck yourself. I don't even talk about my fucking girlfriend when I'm out. Do you know what I'm saying? I love her to death. She's one of my best friends. I have my life. You know, I'm not showing nobody pictures of us. This is us in front of Gotham's Comedy Club. No, fuck you. But that's what girls do. That's their thing. You know what I'm saying? When did you know that stand-up was the thing for you? Like, what night, what moment, uh, what city, what, what happened? I liked everything about it, bro. Everything about it fit me like a glove. Usually, let's say, you become a stockbroker. You like the money, and you like your boss, but you don't like the hours, the stress. There is, there's always a 50-50 thing with any job you take. Whether it's a lawyer, a baker, there's always going to be something. With comedy, 75% of it fit me. A, I don't want to be at the same place at the same time working for my 401k. I don't want to do that. If I got to get up in the morning to go to a job, I'd rather as well shoot myself. It just wasn't for me. When I was a kid growing up, I'd see the guys hanging out in the corner in the daytime. My dick would get hard. I love that shit. You know, you're doing something that you don't have to go inside and file fucking papers or whatever. My dick gets hard. That's what gets me, you know. I love it when you're at work. If you two guys are my roommates... And you got to get up and go to work. And, hey, guess what? i got the whole fucking house to myself till 6. That's a gift for some people. Mm-hmm. And I'm one of those people. I always liked working nights. I always liked walking in my house at 4. And now you got to unwind. 
You know, you put on HBO and the thief is on with James Caan. You got a fucking number. You make a milkshake. That's fucking life. Nobody nagging at you. I've seen this already. I don't like this part. Give me the remote. Uh, you know, charm design. You know what I'm saying? Everybody likes that. That's what appealed to me. I like traveling. I love the fact of traveling, of being somewhere different every other week. You know, even if it is Wyoming, even if it is Nebraska, because I'm getting the feel from all my people. These are still our fucking people, bro. Any fucking idiot could go to fucking Ireland. Any idiot could go to Amsterdam. You know, how many people smoke a joint in Iowa? Not too many. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that. I like that factor of it because there's good people everywhere. What about the downtime? The downtime is great because there ain't nothing I want to fucking do. You know, when people go on the road, a lot of comics tend to bring their girlfriends. Why? Why would you bring anybody with you? Peace is peace. It's fucking great to wake up at 11 and go to the free lunch buffet in the hotel lobby and then go to the pool and then go up to your room and smoke a joint and sleep the whole fucking afternoon until 6. Get up, Seinfeld's on, you jerk one off, you take a shower, you go over your set list, bam! Do you know what I'm saying? You bring a girl with you on the road, I want to go to the aquarium. And, you know, now you got to go to a fancy lunch. The buffet's not good enough. You know us, we can eat a fucking scab off an Iranian's head. We don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? We'll live off a can of tuna on the road. When you're in that room and you order room service, even if you don't have the fucking money, even if you're getting a short week in South Bend, Indiana or something like that, it's still fucking cake. You can leave your dish out. You can be in your room naked. You can scratch your balls. You can fart. That, to me, is priceless. That is what priceless is. That's success. You mentioned travel. You didn't, at any point, you didn't get sick of travel? Or is it worth the travel? It's never, I don't know. Yes, it's worth the travel. Sure it is. Bro, I'm taking buses from New York all the way to Texas. You know what I'm saying? To Arlington, Texas. To work at that flea black bag club down there. What's the name of it? Uh, Randy Butler's dump. You're on stage and a roach lands on your head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Shit like that. I mean, you know, who, who looks forward to taking a Greyhound bus to a dump? I do for 800 bucks. Because it's not the 800 you're chasing. It's the dream you're chasing. You're getting closer to your fucking goal every time you do a set. Is it hyenas? That's hyenas, like, that fucking Gary dump. Hood. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, a lot of comics have described comedy as being a drug for them. Is it the same for you? Absolutely. If you don't have it, you go with some drawls. And I like the drugs you get after the show, too. They're usually just as good. Descri describe the drug-like qualities of comedy performance. Well, making seven people laugh is a euphoric experience, you know? Making somebody laugh at something that you think is funny, getting them on board, is a great feeling. It's a great feeling. Killing 300 people is a great feeling, man. You cannot describe it. And, there, you know, what makes guys divorce their wives, quit their day jobs, and, you know, move to suburbs and get a smaller car? What makes a guy do that? pussy a death what makes a guy rearrange his life for comedy comedy does mm -hmm. now do you have a question uh, you know with comedy there's not much health insurance or, or security later on in life has that ever been a fear of yours who gives a fuck I've always lived for today it makes life a lot easier that's number one number two that's why I was married guys I was fucking I had a great job as a roofing estimator. I had a truck. I had an Acura Integra. I had a fucking three thousand dollar stereo in there. I had a condo. I had a baby. I had a fucking beautiful blonde wife. I had my own little back room with a fucking safe and reefer in there. And my own cable. I had it all, and I booted it all for comedy. Everything. Everything. I got rid of for comedy. I'm a dad, you know, and my daughter knows that I had to give this a chance, and she might not understand it at the time. But as she gets older, and I get older, and I explain to her, I took a chance. Did That's it. I took a chance. I took a fucking chance on me, bro. Which a lot of people will never have the chance to say. Too afraid. I took a chance on me. And little by little, even though you have the people that love you in your corner saying to you, bro, this is a tough thing, the best feeling is to get them on board with you, too. That's a great feeling. When your mom and dad look at you and go, after all the money we spent for college, you want to become a fucking comic 
Do you know what I'm saying? And now you should call them up and say, hey, I'm on Darwin and Greg tonight, or hey, I'm on Politically Incorrect. It was worth it. They're like, holy shit. And then they come see you, and now they understand what you do. Right. Now, no, no, you mentioned Andrew Dice Clay. I don't know if so inspired you, but and I know a lot of people get this question as a comic, like, oh, who's your favorite comic? But who is it that opened your eyes? You said Richard Pry Dice. Who is it that opened your eyes to the, to the, to the craft and, and made you seem you know, that you were capable of doing it yourself? Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor got me interested in stand-up comedy. Kennison was fucking amazing. But when I seen Andrew Dice Clay's, Chris, that special he did from Philly, it was the first time I understood what stand-up was by transforming your thoughts into words that you could never even imagine. All comedy really is is me bringing up a subject and you saying, holy shit. He's fucking right. You know, one night I had a, I tell people a story all the time. One night I was at home watching the news and I had a showcase for APA. And I had my fucking set list, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just about to go in the shower and they showed a carjacking on the news. And it was one of the most funniest things I ever seen in my life. It was two Samoans in Oceanside. And the one brother took this white guy out and as he was pulling him out, he had a seatbelt on, and he couldn't get out, so the Samoan kept punching him in the fucking face. He must have hit him 16 times, and then the seatbelt loosened, and he threw him out. So Samoan gets in the car. Then they show the sister running down the block, chasing her brother, and as she goes to dive on the truck, she misses, and she lands. You know these fucking Samoans are 9,000 pounds, you know what I'm saying? So I go do my showcase, and I go up on stage with two fucking corny jokes I wrote, for industry, and nothing happened. The room looked at me, and all of a sudden I took a chance and said, fuck that. Who seen the Samoan carjacking today? And I went into this tirade, and I ripped the room apart. Because people got in their car, and they was thinking like, man, that was bizarre. You can't say that, nothing to your wife or your mother-in-law about that article, because they'll feel bad for the white guy getting punched for wearing his fucking seatbelt. But the renegades, like you and us three, it's fucking hysterical. But guess what? Even at the Improv, which is white America, the place went ballistic when I said that story because everybody watched the news and wanted to say something and couldn't. And that's what comedy is. We're speaking for you. We're telling you what's funny to everybody. It's like Dice said that thing. He's at the airport and he's with a chick that's hot and this guy comes up to me, they want to make you embarrassed. You're like, you want to buy a flower for the lady? Listen, pal, I fucked this lady ten times already. What do I need your fucking flower for? It's like the girl that sucks your dick and then asks you when you're taking her to dinner. You had your dinner. You had your dinner. What so fucking dinner? The damage is done. Why am I going to, you know? So you basically like the no limits. No limits. No okay. Comedy does not have boundaries. And in L.A., they've given it boundaries. These fucking idiots that go to Syracuse for four years come out and they give it boundaries. Comedy has no boundaries. It's you, a microphone, a stage, and it's wide fucking open. <coughs> Only in L.A. do they say, I understand if you're doing a Tonight Show and you want to censor your show. I understand that. But to get on a, a stage and say it's a clean stage, you know what? Take the stage and the microphone and shove it up your mother's ass. I don't want to perform here anyway. If you're that uptight about something you don't even do, how can you judge it? Get a tissue, Mike. I'm fucking dying here. <laughs>